Sayın misafirlerimiz, Keynote oturumuna hoş geldiniz. Başlamadan önce bir video gösterimiz var. Hep birlikte izliyoruz. Siz de İstanbul Design Slash Collection adresine tasarımlarınızı kaydedilerek uluslararası tasarım ağının bir parçası olabilirsiniz. Sayın misafirlerimiz, şimdi keynote oturumuna geçiyoruz. And now I would like to invite Mr. Karim Rashid, industrial designer who has more than 3,000 designs, more than 300 awards and more than 40 countries in order to convey his valuable opinions and contributions. Hello, everybody. Um, do you have translation? Yes? Good. I hope many, many of you speak English, though, so you can understand. Um, I'm going to talk today about design, not about my work, about the way the world is changing, and how specifically how this moment in which we live, there's a very, very big change taking place to uh, really, um, how can I say, evolve us to the next level of where we're going to go as human beings, what our behaviors will be like, what our beings will be like. Uh, but the first thing I will say is uh, that I want to define design, because design, the syntax, the word itself, we all know is uh, German etymology. It's, it's the sign, the program. So when, when we decided to design something, we have to build a program. We have to basically figure out what we're going to try to solve. What are the problems that we're after and how we are going to find solutions. So we have a hypothesis and we find solutions and we end with a result and hopefully a good positive result. Which means then design is not just designing physical objects or designing interface or designing space or designing buildings, but design is every part of our daily lives because we can design ourselves. We can wake up in the morning and decide over a five-year plan, over a 10-year plan, what I want to do with my future. What will be my contribution? What do I do? Shall I design my health? Do I design my knowledge, my education? Do I design my being, my ethics, my beliefs? You can design cities, we can design programs, we can design systems. So this is design. So really you could argue since the noumenon, the beginning of human culture, which goes back how much, 50,000 years maybe from Neanderthals, us as human beings that have existed for 50, 100,000 years maximum, we have been designing the earth and the world in which we have today. Everything we've done has led us to this point today, March 1st, 2019. This is the world we have. So when you wake up in the morning and you look at this world around you, you can accept all of it and say, this is the world I live in, this is the way I'm supposed to be, this is the way I'm supposed to act, this is the way I'm supposed to exist. Or you can question it all and say, it was designed this way, I would like to make some change. I don't really necessarily believe that I have to live in the world as it stands today. Now, if we're talking about creatives, and I assume many of you in the audience are either designers or students or architects or, or cultural shapers of one another, we need to be inspired. And the greatest thing that can inspire you, frankly, is to be highly perceptive of the world you live in. You can even do something that I've tried to do for the last, let's say, since my conscious years, I'm going to say 50 years, is to try to believe that I don't come from this planet. 
Because if I say, hey, I, I, I don't really come from here, and I examine human culture and human beings and ho human social behaviors, first of all, Jesus, um, <laughs> I should hang on to it and swing. <laughs> if I, if I uh, kind of critique um, the, the world I live in, I can say, well, you know what? In these conscious years of mine, the question is, I see in front of me these kinds of issues, these kinds of problems. I found recently I'm probably most inspired by everything that's wrong about the world in which we live. That in itself is inspiration. Because why? Because immediately then you say, okay, I have to make it better. Make it better as just on the human experience level, make it better, let's say, aesthetically, make it better sustainab uh, sustainably, make it better just that we can have a more seamless world. If I design a door and a company comes to me and says, well, uh, let's, let's design some doors together, my first reaction of the door was, because you could argue a door is a very banal thing. There's not a lot of room, a lot of to maneuver to make a door, right? First reaction was, why do I need a door handle? Why isn't the door the door handle? Now, we have doors that push and close, and that you don't have handles, but if you want to lock a door and have a lock, can I build the handle built into the door somehow? And that became my challenge. I created my own, let's say, hypotheses. I came up with my own problem and decided to solve it and tr create a door that had no handle that could still lock. So why do I feel that's important? Well, n number one important is that if we look at the history of the world, we have lived in the analog, steeped in the analog age for the last 50,000 years. We believed so much in immateriality. We believed so much in permanence. In architecture, in the School of Architecture, they have taught for the last 300 years in architecture that building a building is a permanent act. It's the greatest act of the ego of the architect, to build something that will outlive him or her. For example, the Milan Cathedral. It took 220 years to build. It took five generations of architects to build it. So the fifth architect was the only one who actually saw it realized in completion. Can you imagine you devote your life to build, designing a building that you never see complete? Okay, today we, we can create a 98-story tower in, in Shanghai within four years. So the world's changed a lot in the sense of, of technology and how fast we can move and what we can produce. But the analog world always had this idea, this notion, that the physical things around us gave us some sense of meaning to our lives. So if we surrounded ourselves with things, we somehow it gave us some sense of immortality. But the reality is, we now know better that physical things are not going to ever give us immortality. So if you look at pharaohs, for example, they were buried with gold and gild and a lot of material. Why? They take all this stuff with them to the afterlife. Do they? Do we need all this physicality around us? The analog is 50,000 years old, minimally, for us. And all the way through it, we designed. We designed the wheel, we designed fire, in a sense that how we can use it. We designed the idea of cooking food and heating food. We designed agricultural ways of making crops. This was the evolution of humanity. We started out with a tool like this. This was our prosthetics. And we built a cave. So what did we do when we made a cave? We dug with our hands. And in fact, when we dug with our hands a cave, we ended up making a womb-like structure. And I'll segue and I'll get back to what I mean by the womb structure. But there was nothing linear. Do you know a straight line does not exist in nature? We are organic, we're asymmetrical, we're amorphous. Then we built a tool, and that tool in our hand afforded us to work a little faster. You could argue that was the first stage of, let's say, production. We even did things like, for example, the Aztecs, they were building somebody, having somebody who styled a vase or an urn, and they would have 20 or 30 people copy it. That was the early forms of mass production, the idea that we could duplicate the product, that we could start to create serialization. Then the Industrial Revolution comes along, 
180 years ago, Essen, England, and we start creating a machine. And the first machine we start to create was a bandsaw. And that bandsaw afforded us to cut straight lines. From that, it afforded us to start to produce goods, products, and things that were linear. Cheap to mass produce, we could just cut, cut, cut. Next thing you know, we make extrusions. We do all kinds of linear things. Next thing you know, we start building a Cartesian world, a grid-like world. Next thing you know, we build acoustic panels, tile carpets, tiles on the floor, wood strips, onward and onward and onward and onward. You start to build an entire world made of 2D, consumable, cheap parts. That's what the Industrial Revolution did to us. So, 50,000 years of analog, it was all about permanency, it was about mass, it was about something that the heavier it was, the more important it was. Then the analog, then the digital age comes along. The digital age now, right now, is approximately 45 years old. For most of us, it's 15, 20. And in the digital age, it started to teach us something. The first thing it started to teach us is that we are starting to have more experiences and diverse experiences, and you could even argue more seductive and more pleasurable experiences without something physical. So back in the day, when a Rolls Royce took 40 men three months to produce, that was called luxury. Why? Because of, it took three months to make one car. Today, how do you make a Rolls Royce? <laughs> Robotic. Spray booth. 160 little spray guns, just the same way you make a mini. So, first of all, you could question, what is luxury? What is luxury today? Second thing you can question is, all that energy and all that material and all that time, and you could even argue since the Industrial Revolution, all those toxins and all those chemicals and everything that we've done in 180 years, and it's interesting, this last 180 years, we have done more damage to this earth than human beings did in 50,000 years. And we did it all beautifully in 180 years. And we're brilliant. Not because we're destroying the earth, but we managed to do these phenomenal things that we managed to produce 12,000 different polymers that can almost do anything. You can have plastic that's stronger than steel. You can have a polymer that's bulletproof. You can have a polymer, like I have inside me from a few operations, that's inside me. You can have a polymer, even more so, the microchip, right in your eyeball. That's amazing. So we've done some amazing things. When people say, hey, we need to eradicate plastic, let's stop using plastic straws, this is the movement in America, it means nothing in the scheme of the amount of polymer in the earth and in the world. Nothing. It's like a tiny little dent. But at the same time, when you go to hospital, 70% of all that stuff that they're using to have an oper to, for an operation to save your life is all plastic and all polymer. So then what do you do? Can you just throw away all the plastic tomorrow? Not really. So what we've created during the Industrial Revolution is on one hand, an absolute human evolution to no end, to so beyond what we've ever done historically, and on the other hand, we've been destroying the Earth. Now, in the 50,000 years of analog, I'm going to give it just a little example. This stage is 50,000 years. So digital, the 20 years, the 40 years, is this piece of um, corrugated board here. So that's where we are right now. So if you think you, we are steeped in the digital age, we haven't even begun. Because the digital age, for us, we are the pioneers. We are the pioneers of the digital age. We are at the turning point. We're at the kind of schism. Hence the fear of the world and how it's changing so quickly and drastically. We are frightened about it because it's all so new. 
And we're full of hypocrisy. Because on one hand, we're looking at screens seven and a half hours a day on average. Imagine of your waking day, more than half you're looking at that. Maybe you're not, I don't know. So we're steeped in it, but then we step away and we're all a bit afraid. We're afraid of the idea of digital prosthetics. We're afraid of the idea that the microchip will end up in here. We're afraid that the physical phone will be the tattoo here on my wrist. But it's inevitable. Not only is it inevitable, all these prototypes already exist. Five years ago, I was working in the media lab at Queen's University, and we were developing, working on an iPad-like object, and it was a plastic screen, translucent, that you could do this with, roll it, and put it in your pocket. In the next five years, it's on the market. So the phone, and think about telephony. Telephony, when I started as a designer, my first job I got in 1980 as a student was work designing telephones, business sets. And the business set I was doing was this wedged object with a bunch of buttons on it, a bunch of buttons down here, handset, and the cord. And I remember working on those things. I was so naive, 20 years old, I had no idea what I was doing. All those things were so, to me, crass, vile, and ugly. But I learned a lot. I tried to make it really colorful. Nobody accepted any of that. Times have really changed in regards to that. But that phone still exists now because it's sad. You know, I'm in a hotel or somewhere, and there's this black wedged phone sitting there with the same handset, which is, you know, so backward. But the phone, if you think about it, was a two-piece handset. Injection molded plastic, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, all these parts. And all those parts went dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun, dun. And I just finished a phone in China last year, and I had nothing to do. I had no job, but they gave me a job anyway. I didn't know what I was doing. What am I going to do with a phone? What are you going to design with a phone? There's nothing left, right? The reality is there's nothing left. I, I, I love to design the interface. They didn't want me to touch the interface. You know why I want to design the interface? Because the phone I proposed to them was oval. And I found 3M, and by the way, I love technology. I found 3M makes a, made a technology of a, material, a surface, a nano surface, that we could spray the back of the phone with, that if you put the phone vertically in your hand, it wouldn't fall. Because the nano layer would, with your sweat of your palm would adhere. But you wouldn't feel it sticky. It's not sticky, but somehow it could just sit like that. So that was my contribution to their phone, because I couldn't do anything else. And I had made it oval. And they loved the oval phone. But they said it's impossible. And why is it impossible? Because inside the phone is a circuit board and a, a Cartesian screen. Pixels. And pixels are Cartesian. Hence the problem. It's all 2D, and it has to be a grid. So if you want to cut the, the LCD on, a, on, a, on an ellipse, you'll only get the image come up as a rectangle. So then my phone was a big ellipse with a small rectangle in it. So it couldn't do it. Because you end up with all this excess larger object with small information. And you know why we couldn't do it? Because the iOS system of Apple and the um, PC, uh, Android, is a grid. So the only way I can do it if I started, or they started, their own new operating system. Then you could design an operating system that could be based on some other thing other than a matrix. So the hands are tied. So the hands are tied when I design a kitchen for Scavolini, and it's got to be a bunch of boxes because it has to fit into the condominium, which is a bunch of boxes. And then I design a refrigerator for Guarenye or for LG Electronics, and it's got to be a grid, the stove, because it has to fit into 60 by 60 centimeter because it's a grid. So if you look at the world we created, it's grid after grid after grid. So when I designed a credit card, oh, can the um, translator keep up? Am I speaking too fast? Am I? Who's, who's bilingual here who's listening? Is, she, is he doing a good job? <laughs> it's a tough job to do. I really admire it, actually. 
some of these people. I met somebody the other day, translator, nine languages fluently. It's amazing. Anyway, so where was I? Cartesian grid, right? Everything is a grid. So I designed for Citibank a credit card. So they came to me 10 years ago. Let's make a credit card. So I went back to my office. I started making all kinds of shapes. I wanted to make something soft. I have an issue to corners. Soft go in your pocket like a worry stone. Everything should be nice and soft. We're soft. We're weak, volatile human beings. We're soft. Every chair I sit in should be soft and comfortable. We should do everything around us to make our world more seamless. But we have this Cartesian world to deal with, this kind of grid. So I came back to them the next day, and I made one card, it was really nice, it was an oval shape, but it was your fingerprint was the whole, it was just basically that. That was the card. And they looked at me and they said, oh, I'm sorry, I think you misunderstood the project. You has to be a rectangle, the card. I said, oh, so it's a graphic project. And they said, yes, I thought you want to revolutionize. You guys talked about revolutionizing the card. And they said, 1.6 million ATMs around the world take a rectangle. So I had to make it a rectangle. So then I thought, ha ha, maybe if I cut like a little wave on each side, it'll still go in and out of the machine. So we made a whole bunch of prototypes, cutting things to try them and see if they still work. But at the end of the day, Citibank wasn't interested in any of that. They just wanted a graphic. But it was part of my frustration of this idea that the we built a Cartesian world. In other words, when we designed, let's say since, since Renaissance, since we learned and understood first point perspective, and we draw on a drafting table, we drew everything 2D, everything. So you know what we did? We shaped a two-dimensional world, you could argue. Because if you look around the world in the last 150 years, we more or less, except for the odd craft-like person like Gaudi or somebody, in general, we just created Cartesian world, grids, everywhere. So in actual fact, as you drew in 2D, the world became 3D. Then it dawned on me, it was 1989, and I was designing mailboxes in Canada for Canada Post. And there was two young guys near me that had a software company startup called Alias. And in their software company, they were showing a 3D rendering program. And they said to me, come over, use our software, try it out. So I went over there to work on the mailboxes. I spent three months, and at the end of three months, I had a cube rotating. We've come a long way, right? But I knew it. At that second, I said, 3D, three-dimensional. We are 3D. Yet somehow, we live in a 2D world. And that moment, I realized I will never look at another project in two dimensions again. So I never look at a plan, an elevation, a section, a top view, a bottom view, a side view. Because I have 3D software and I work in 3D. And look at what we've created then in the last 20 years. How dimensional our buildings are becoming how with software technologies that are affording us to do really 3D, complex, beautiful work, our softwares are affording us to do original things. The reason we're all jumping on this as creatives is because there's an opportunity to do something new. And the greatest thing I find in humankind is this desire to do something new to do something original. And you are on this earth to do something original. And that's why you're all here. That's it. And you see this fingerprint. The repetition of this fingerprint is one in 40 billion. So none of you will ever have my fingerprint. And I, nobody will have someone else's fingerprint. Why do we have a different fingerprint? This is the key to everything. 
literally a key, because I should be able to go up to uh, the border crossing and do this. And I should be able to go buy something and do this. And I should be able to go to the doctor's office and do this. And I should be able to basically navigate seamlessly around the world with this. And that's around the corner too. This is not science fiction. Fifteen years ago, I used to go to my gym every day in New York and use my fingerprint to go into the gym. Then I would go and stand on one of these very sophisticated BMI reader weight They put my fingerprint there and it would check all my barometers of my body. That was 15 years ago. What's taking so long? BMW released nine years ago the door, car door, with a fingerprint. We're slow. We're afraid. We're afraid at accepting these kind of changes, and yet we've managed to completely accept globally being free, democratic, no boundaries, no nationalism, no jingoism, no racism, no fanaticism in the virtual world. The virtual world has connected all of us. The virtual world is shrinking this world so quickly that it's a beautiful phenomenon. And technology, side to side with the virtual world, is affording better and better experiences. How, how beautiful is it that you're running through Linz, Switzerland, and you're lost when you're jogging, and you just do this with the GPS, and it tells me, did, did, did, did my vibrate, and I turn right, turn left, oh, I'm back at the hotel. How beautiful is this stuff? We're already, in a very short amount of time, taking all these things for granted. And then, the minute we leave that screen, we turn around, and I look at the world, at least I do, and go, my God, the physical world is boring. It's banal. That desk I'm sitting at, oh my God, what is this thing? The coffee mug I'm drinking, it's disgusting. The aeroplane I get on, it's so badly designed. I start looking around me and I go, why am I living in this beautiful virtual utopia where I have tens of thousands of acquaintances and relationships and friends and connections where I'm inspired on a minute-by-minute on a -minute basis, where I'm flexible to almost do anything and create anything. Remember, the creation is originality. When you have a child, that child is original, and that's a form of creation, procreation. Then there's intellectual creation. Intellectual creation is your contribution, your intellectual contribution to the world. And how do you do something original, and why do something original? First of all, why? It's a human desire. And you know what? It starts when you're a little child, and the first thing you want to do as a child is draw or make something. Why is that? Why are we inclined to want to create? And then what happens to us? 20 years later, and someone, and someone says to me, oh, I, I can't draw. Well, you drew. We all drew. When you go to a nursery or, a, or grade one school and you see all the drawings of the kids, amazing, actually. It's amazing the mind and the hand-body connection. So we're all here to create. We can do both, procreate, intellectually create. We can do one. But that's our contribution. And to do something original, and people always say to me this, they say, how or why, um, sorry, um, why is it so important for you to do something original? Well, it's kind of simple, isn't it? The world's existed for thousands of years. A lot has been done. Amazing amount of things have been done. I personally, I couldn't be satisfied by repeating something that already existed. Why? What am I then? Am I a designer? Is that design? Look at interior design. Let me talk about interior design for a moment. What we call interior design, most of the time, is interior decorating. And what's the difference of decorating and designing? It's like the Italians. They call designers and architects architecti. But they call fashion designers stiliste. Why? They don't call them designers. Because they style. And what is style? Style is when you borrow from history. So the way we actually have packaged and chronologically 
let's say, spoke about our history is through styles. So we had the Belle Epoque style, Wittengale style, Brutalist style, art decorative style, modernist style, onward and onward, right? Classical style, neoclassical. We call it style because the movement is over. And at one time, that movement wasn't just about aesthetics or form. It was a movement. It was about beliefs. It was about the way people thought. It was political. It was social. But when it ends, we look back at it and we, at least in the world of, let's say, the applied arts, we call it style. So if I, someone says to me, oh, design a restaurant that's Baroque-like. Imagine if a client said that to you. First thing is, I would say, bye-bye. What, what does Baroque have to do with the world I live in now? Seriously. Right? Absolutely nothing. As soon as they say Baroque-like, you're styling. And if you're styling, you go back into the vaults of history, you look up Baroque, you think you're being inspired, you do your research, but your inspiration is not inspiration, it's derivation. In fact, what we call inspiration the majority of the time, a lot of times, is appropriation, copies. Modernism, it's a style. Modernism as a philosophy was actually a reductiveness of your being. Less is more. That's what modernism was. But now modernism as a style means I use pure geometry. I make a perfect cube uh, stool. I make a long, perfect rectangular table. We call that modernism. You know what? If you do that, you're styling too. That, all that's been done. There's been tens of thousands of long rectangular tables. So what the question is, what's your contribution? And if we just derivate perpetually and keep adding to the morass, the morass or the plethora of things, is that good for the earth? Is, what's the contribution there? If tomorrow, Amra had a project to design for a company that makes bent plywood, let's say, okay? The Charles Eames chair, the potato chip chair, it was the first time Herman Miller, first time a company in the world, managed to bend plywood in two directions, compound. That's why until today we see that chair as an icon or we see that chair as pivotal. In other words, the things that stand out in history that we consider pivotal always imbued a new technology, all of them. Alvar Aalto bent a chair in 2D, new technology. Thornay, late 1800s, bent hardwood, new technology. So you say, well, what's the new technology today? What, I could be using the latest software and create something that's never been done before. I could find a production method that's never been used in this way before. I could go to a company that makes, I don't know, erasers for pencils and end up with a rubber chair. No one took an eraser and made it into a chair. That's innovation, not derivation. So, and it's tricky. It's very difficult. Why is it difficult? Because a lot in the physical world has been done. This is the issue. This is the biggest problem. We are saturated, you could argue, the physical world. The chair is the ideological model for the architect. Great thing to challenge yourself with. It's about structure. It's about comfort. It's about communication, it's a message, it's a material, it's a technology. But can we create an original chair? Because I would say there's more than a million chairs done. So when I get a chair project, I say that to myself. I challenge myself. See that chair there? That's new. Whoops. Okay. I challenge myself. So the first thing I say is technology. Let's see. Hmm. Because I'm going to make sure I make a comfortable chair. That's a given. If you design, it's got to be comfortable. If it's not comfortable, it shouldn't exist on this planet. But the important part is I say, what am I going to contribute? So I was down in, um, in San Paolo. I met a company called Brascom. They produce polypropylene and polyethylene 
from sugar cane? I said, oh, that's fantastic. Because sugar grows abundantly. It's not a food source. There's no nutrition in it. And in fact, we never ate sugar, human beings, up until 240 years ago. All our sugar came from fruit and vegetables. So we don't need sugar. In fact, it's part of what's killing this earth, too. Killing us. Diabetes, heart disease, onward. Cancer. So I say, great, let's use sugar to make plastic chairs. So we try one. We do it. PP, it's polypropylene, same polypropylene that comes from oil, but this comes from sugar. So I say, okay, that's my contribution. I've got to contribute something. Because I'm not contributing to something, I don't need to be doing this profession. And none of you need to be doing this profession if there isn't some level, again, of, of original contribution, and most importantly, that. Because that's you. Now, if the 2D world, designing in 2D, looking at something in the plan, top view, elevation, made this 3D world, then designing in 3D makes a fourth dimensional world. And what's the fourth dimension? What's the fourth dimension? What's the fourth dimension? Time. Fantasy, I love that, that's great. Time and fantasy. I love that, really. Time, and what is time? Human experience. So, as I speak, these words and what I'm saying will never, ever be repeated the same way again. Because every little cell in my body right now is dying and other cells are being reborn. In other words, nothing is static. The chair you sit on is not static. In fact, it's probably polyurethane, and it's probably emitting toxic gas. Nothing is static. Hence, nothing is permanent. Hence, we live as human beings in the moment, and that moment is experience, which is time. So, we are going to build, by designing in 3D, the fourth dimensional, more experiential world. In other words, we focus on creating better experiences, beautiful experiences. And they can be banal things. I'll give you an example. I'm doing a hotel in Rome right now, and I, for 15 years, want to do this, and no client ever agreed. I finally did it. The bathroom floor is just one perfect piece of rubber. Such a simple little thing. Every day I'm in a gym with rubber floors. Why can't my bathroom have a rubber floor? Why can't I get out of the shower soft if I fall? Do you know that 17% of men's heart attacks happen in the shower? Do you know that? And usually it's on a Wednesday. And I never take a shower on a Wednesday, by the way. <laughs> That's my... So... But 15 years ago, I worked for a company in Spain that produces rubber sinks. And you see this perfect, round, beautiful, glossy sink. And when you walk up to it, it bounces when you press against it. It's so great. I love this company. I was going to even try to invest in the company. The company disappeared because nobody believed the fear of the rubber sink. Because they, everybody said the first thing, well, how do you clean it? The, the way it looked, it looked like ceramic, high gloss. You clean it like any other sink. Everybody feared. They gave a 20-year warranty. They still went out of business. The reason they went out of business is because in the physical world, somehow we exist in the past. We are steeped in the past, in the physical world, and we're steeped with pre-associations. We want to believe that wood is warm and glass is cold. Roland Barth wrote about this in the 1950s. This wood floor in front of you looks atrocious because there's thousands of scratches. Look at it all. Look. And for them to come in and redo this floor is a huge job. It's two days, sawdust, dust everywhere. So why do we keep putting wooden floors in public spaces? So that when we walk in, we go, oh, nature. <laughs> None of this is nature. Engineered wood is not nature. It's the biggest scam in the world. 
We're fooling ourselves. And why, and I hope there's a bunch of architects and interior designers here, why don't we step back and stop styling space? Oh, the Baroque-like restaurant, so I go and copy a bunch of Baroque things. Oh, maybe put some chandeliers and put my spin on it. Bullshit. Sorry. You turn to the restaurateur, and you know what you say to him? You say what I said to him. Why on earth, when I live with the most comfortable sneakers in the world, why, when I would never wear a tie around my neck, which is, by the way, the way women keep men in bondage, why on earth, why on earth do women wear high heels? Because that's a way of men keeping women in bondage. Why on earth have nothing to do with the world we live in? Because we should be running around like we're walking on the moon, with a lot of technology and products do that for us. We should be wearing things that don't wrinkle, and you roll them up and you throw them in your luggage. That's the technology. I wear T-shirts from Uniqlo. You know Uniqlo, the company? They're heat. They cool down when I'm hot, like right now. Cool my body down. And opposite, when I'm cold. This is fantastic, isn't it? But we're afraid of these things. But we're not afraid to go online and, and, uh, and, and engage the entire world, are we? Why is it you can't go out and buy a couch that's good for using an iPad or a laptop? Nobody has done it. Style. And I'm pushed, and you may look at some products and you go, well, you know what, you're a hypocrite because you're making some products that exist like the, the so-called archetypes that exist. I'm pushed into it half the time because the clients can't think beyond the archetype. That's the archetype. Why is it that a professional camera looks like the cameras from the 1970s? Black, big lens. Uh. Like the cameras I owned. I owned a Nikon at that time. Those things don't look any different. Why is that? It's fake. Because we know that the digital camera doesn't have a film that runs across the, the shutter. That's how the camera formed itself. Good industrial design years ago, like a good interior or good architecture, was informed on basically on its function. When something functioned, if you worked around that function, you ended up with a beautiful solution. And in fact, I think humanity, you can go and make the most wild thing you want, crazy space, everything, but if it functions seamlessly, everybody loves it. I made some very crazy hotels around the world, but they function perfectly because I'm determined they function perfectly. Because when I walk in the room myself, I don't want to stub my toe on the edge of the bed. I don't want to sit on a chair that has legs that go beyond the perimeter of the seat and back so that I'm going to hit it every time I walk by. These things seem so simple that I go into a hotel room and I want to turn the shower on without getting wet. Okay, just now in the W again. I have to like reach, I do this strategy, you know, because the water's going to come out really cold. And you got to like <laughs> and dive out of the shower really good. This is absurd. This is the world that you, you are drawing and creating. This is the world that we are shaping for what? Why? Because when you walked into the bathroom, there was a nice, perfect chrome faucet. And the corners of that faucet could kill. But it looks good. Is that what it's about? That we become that superficial as a human race because this is the problem with the world of imagery, that we're looking at tens of thousands of images on a daily basis, that Instagram, 1.7 billion images are being produced a day. Where do they keep them? I'd like to visit this cloud one day. It must be huge. Nobody gets my jokes. Um, <laughs> it's my Canadian in me, I think. You know what I'm saying? 1.7 billion images. How on earth can you sit down and read a thesis or an intellectual paper when you're bombarded with imagery? Is that the way we're going? Is that the way the world is moving? that the world will become just visual? Because, you know, aesthetics, the word aesthetics, which I love, is Greek, etymology, feeling. Nobody said aesthetics was visual. Feeling. And what is feeling? Experience. So if I design a hotel, a restaurant, I'm making a hospital right now. The hospital I'm making, I'm determined you go there, it doesn't matter how bad the doctors are, you will get better. 
Why not? Nine years ago, I was in a hospital in, in, in New York. It was the most depressing experience of my life. I had cancer. Weeks lying in this disgusting hospital. Disgusting. That was disgusting. The food was disgusting. The whole experience. Nothing nice about the experience. It doesn't have to be this way. And I'm telling you, it's amazing our mind and how space and the energy of space around us can affect us and make us well. And we can create better well-being, better experiences, greater pleasure, more, what's the word, positive energy, positive energy, so that you can walk out of that space and you had a really pleasurable experience. I'll give you another example. I don't know what it's like in Istanbul, but I went to a few restaurants, so I think it's the same. So noisy. The acoustics are so bad. And the place is packed. It's like, I don't understand us as human beings. Are we masochistic? So, you know, I design, every time I design a restaurant, you know what I do? Every table, I put huge acoustic panels under the tables. So you never see them, but just to absorb as much sound as possible. Why is it every restaurant I go to, I can't read the menu? Because it's so dark. What's that about? And we're accepting these things on a daily basis. The automobile, my mother is now 87. She cannot get in and out of a car. 1970 was the doctrine called universal design. You know what universal design means? Does anybody know that term? It meant that an 8-year-old and an 80-year-old should be able to use a product. I love that. I always love that. When, when journalists say to me, so what, what market or a client? Or our target market is 25 to 32. I'm like, I don't care about any of that stuff. Make something good, we'll all embrace it. Do something good, we'll all love it. Do something good and we'll all be inspired. Because I want to be inspired. Don't you want to be inspired? I mean, think about travel, for example. When you travel, okay? What's giving you a differentiated experience when you travel? All the stores have become the same, right? If you go down the main strip in Frankfurt or the main strip in Via Condotti in, in wherever, Rome or whatever, same shops, same brands. Every duty-free shop, same brand. Does anybody go in a duty-free shop anymore? Don't. The world has shrunk to the point where the sameness is nauseating. But the world was never the same. The beauty of the world was, I remember when I was 10 years old and my mother came back from Austria and brought me some very cool little pin with one of those yodeling guys on it and brought back things from Paris like Dijon mustard, which was unheard of in Toronto. You know, this, we traveled and we found these exotic things. We had exotic food. We had exotic experiences. The only thing left now to travel for is nature, which is different around the world, or architecture. And even architecture is starting to suffer. So you go see a monument, like, okay, let's go see the Eiffel Tower, right? Because the French, and a lot of cities don't understand this, the French get 14 million people visiting the Eiffel Tower every year. Go build yourself a rusted piece of metal. That thing was built in 1840 or whenever it was, right? By the way, Eiffel, he was a radical guy. It took 42 years for them to finally build that tower from when he designed it. But that thing, as I said earlier, was pivotal because it was the first te time technology to build a tower in pig iron. First time. That's why it's important. But it's not a huge thing. Now when you go there, if you go there for the first time, you're so disappointed. It's like, what? And it's kind of nasty. You go up this like elevator and it's disgusting, kind of, right? Rivets. So if Paris can get 14 million tourists like that, think about any city in the world, any place, build a something, a radical new monument, the tourism will come. So, why travel? Maybe language, maybe food, people, yes. 
But if the people become the same, and now I'm going to, this is my contradiction of the beauty of the digital age is it's affording all of us a new democracy. It's affording the world to become one. It's breaking down all the boundaries and borders. It's affording you to have social relations with anybody and everybody in the world which affords us to become mixed. Just like flying on EasyJet. Because you know what? 40 years ago in the United States, only 3% of Americans left the country. Today, 47% a year leave the country. That's what technology afforded us. So we're not naive anymore, we're not ignorant anymore. Nobody, there's no corner of the earth that can hide because there's 16,000 satellites around the world. That's amazing. So the digital age is amazing. The digital age affords me to have less. Frankly, in 10 years, I don't want any pockets on any of my clothes. In fact, I don't like pockets. Why do I need pockets? Because I won't have anything to carry. Because I don't need anything. How beautiful is that? I'm worried constantly about my thing called the passport, which is a book with paper in it with rubber stamps. Think how stupid. Rubber stamp technology is 800 years old. How old is paper technology? Why? And we fear we lose this thing and we're like stranded, right? I mean, I remember, I remember being in Germany and, and they, they, the, the, the border crossing, he looked at my passport, saw one on a point of entry, and somehow the date was smudged and he, didn't want to, he wanted to know when I came in the country. I tell him, he pulled me aside. I spent 40 minutes being interrogated, probably because I have an Egyptian name too. And, um, but because of a smudged ink, come on. So, if our, let's go to architecture, an interior space, things that are more what I would call one-off, that they really, you have to travel and experience to, or to go there to experience it. That's interesting, because then you are afforded an opportunity to do something in con contextual of that place, or do something that's never been done before in that place, to see something original. You know, Zaha Hadid, she, she said, I don't, I don't care about context, meaning I, can, I put my architecture anywhere in the world. Okay? On one hand, there's something beautiful about that, because we have this shrinking world. On the other hand, what about that place? What about if I go to Azerbaijan? and I see a building by her. Should I see something that's, first of all, I'll see something that's never been built because of course her buildings are all different, so I see something original. But if it's in a certain milieu, a vernacular, that's quite similar to other things, I'm not criticizing Zaha, she was a very good friend, but I'm not really in that place anymore, am I? Where am I? And this is a little of the issue with the virtual space, is that you walk into a place, you come to Istanbul, right? Full, it's chaotic, lots of energy, a lot of traffic, a lot of people. And if you're like this, you're not experiencing this. So differentiation, I think in a way, is key to evolution, to afford us that if we become one world, which we will become. We all will eventually will become one nation. The beauty of that is no nationalism, no fanaticism. There's something beautiful about that because we have fought 10,000 years of wars from borders and religion. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And you know, most, almost everybody has the same needs and similar desires. In other words, we're not really different, but intellectually and somehow the way we were created, we are all completely different. And that's a beautiful paradox. So what would I like to see? I would love that I venture into the world and I see around me 
inspiration. That if I go out to a new restaurant around the corner in Istanbul, I walk into something that is somewhat original, something I haven't seen before, some kind of nice nuance of a new idea, something different. Because the information age is causing, you could argue, also trending, which starts to build the similar styles that are proliferated. So 15 years ago, in Brooklyn, because a lot of the Brooklyn warehouses are brick, they were left pretty raw because people who were opening up restaurants and bars didn't have a budget to make an interior. They ended up buying some old metal stools, like the Tolex stools from 1926, but the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy of the copy of that stool. And that language of all of a sudden a couple of light bulbs showing a filament, industrial revolution, next thing you know, it proliferates around the world. Next thing you know, there's 15 of those right around the corner from me, from my hotel. Next thing you know, they're in Kyiv, Ukraine, and they're in Tel Aviv. Why? Then you're not designing. Whoever the designers are that are doing this, they're calling themselves designers. This is not design. Because first of all, it's derivative. Second of all, it's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the time we live in at all. There is no reason that, that I should be seeing the filament in a bulb. In fact, the light bulb is being eradicated from the whole world because it's high energy consumption. The world is LED and OLED. That's the world. So you as a designer, I don't know, Stick some projectors up in the ceiling there and see this little decoration that's spinning. Make the, make the whole place a circle and have projection going around all night while you have dinner. I don't know. Do something original. Then I can travel around this world and see original things. And when I see something original, and this is called the study of phenomenology. I don't know if anybody studied it or understands it. It was started with Hegel and Heidegger school. Philosophy. What they were saying was, phenomenology is what they call the unveiling of an actuality. So, I'll give you an example. You taste something for the first time. You're eating fried cockroaches in, in Bangkok. Weird. In that moment, you feel alive because you realize something about you. It's alive. You taste some soup that you never tasted before. You feel alive. You touch a material or a surface that you've never really experienced. You, feel, you touch someone else's skin. You smell someone's breath or touch their lips for the first... This is phenomena that you feel like, I'm alive. Because frankly, we can wake up every morning, so either spend half your day in bed and don't do nothing in this world, you can wake up every morning and do the same thing and go make the same cup of coffee and da da da da da da da da and go to the job and go home and maybe the odd time every three weeks you get to go, you go see a ballet or something. That's a banal existence. Even more banal than that is sitting where, I, this is the hard part, where you have no choice. You're sitting there having to make something every day just to survive and st repeated motion, repetitive motion for a human being. It's the worst thing for, the, for a human being. So phenomena, phenomenology is this idea of all of a sudden that we're aware we're here. That's why they always say the more experiences you have in this world, the longer your life is. Because if you have a repeated same daily routine, life will pass you by and you won't have those moments of tons of moments of memories, those um, disruptions in your existence. But the reason of all this is the biggest culprit of human existence, fear. Fear is everything. The reason you stay in that routine is fear. The reason you're unhappy in your relationship but you stay in it, fear. The reason that you're afraid to speak to your father, fear. The reason you're afraid to go to another country for a job, fear. The reason, and you could go on and on, 
fear. Fear maybe to walk into a space that's something like you've never existed or experienced before. Ha! Ah. And a designer has to have no fear. And a designer has to live and experience phenomenally ecologically the moment in which they live. And frankly, everybody should. But if you're a creative person and you really want to create, the past is pointless. The past has nothing to do with humanity. And it is pointless. Because all we have is here and now. Done. You don't even have a future. You have here and now. So you experience and learn and see around you and, ex and, and, and, and be perceptive to the here and now. What is the here and now? And why is the past pointless? <laughs> because a big shift, a big change, is the digital age. It's taught us this. So, constructs, repeating history, doing things that exist. I'll give you an example. Designing a building on a small street in New York, in Harlem. It's a bunch of brown brick buildings. Nothing's landmarked. It's just a bunch of brown brick. We have one lot, decide to do something very radical. The whole neighborhood, fear. 1,200 people writing a petition. You can't build this. Fear. What's the fear? They said, you have to make something that looks like the neighborhood. There's the mistake. What does looks like the neighborhood mean? That I'm going to imitate existing facades. I'm going to try to fit in to the urban fabric. But those buildings that were built in 1891, 1902, 1905, you know why the windows were like that and the panes were like that? Because that was the technology. So the wind glass, the float glass was only made that small, and they put them together and made a frame. Today you see a whole new condominium with these fake, fake mullions, because there's one piece of glass behind there. You know the word for this? This is the third German word I'm talking about today, kitsch. Kitsch, because the world is full of kitsch. Because when you make a copy of the original, that's the definition of kitsch. Kitsch is a cheap replica of the original. You will never make the building today like they did in 1902. There's no need to. The technology's gone way beyond. The construction is different. So why are you going to make a facade, a fake 2D facade, by the way? This is how obsessed we were with designing in 2D, which means nothing anymore because the neighborhood was frightened, because everybody's frightened. And what's there to be frightened of? What, who said that? The only thing to fear is fear itself. Who said that? I love that quote. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get some? So, there was, uh, there was no intent to have question and answer, but I love question and answer, and I would like to uh, engage all of you, because inevitably what happens is, a lot of people want to ask me questions after I get off the stage. No. <laughs> so, this is the opportunity. Let's do it now. Now or never. Do we have a microphone? Okay. Anybody have a question? You can ask me anything you want. I may not answer, but you can ask me. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you for this wonderful oh, is that, where are you? Where are okay, you? Okay, I'm here. Okay. Right here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Like, uh, sometimes I feel like we're underestimating the power of aesthetics. Like, as you said, aesthetic has a great potential to uh, express a feeling and create meaning. And like, while we're designing a product, like, we have to consider the tangible qualities of the product as well as the intangible qualities, like 
the uh, connection between the product and the user, the experience. And like, my question is like, what do you think about the ro role of intuition and research in the decision-making process of a product, like especially when, while you're working on the form? Well, f let me just say, I don't, I don't really believe in intuition because I think intuition is your experiences that are telling you that thought, meaning it's... I, I, I work more or less today, very intuitively. I never do any research anymore. But I've been in 3,000 factories, and I've done so much that I have enough knowledge, you know, that immediately when I have an idea, the idea is based on the experiences and the knowledge. Um, but research can be very good, and it all depends on what you do, the product you do. You know, a, a friend of mine was uh, a firm in New York. He was designing a toothbrush, and he, you know, they, they videotaped 50 people brushing their teeth. And uh, I thought it was a, a, a, an opportunity just to, to see the hand movement, how people use the brush, to see if there's an opportunity there for something new. Inevitably, their toothbrush came out it's like every other toothbrush because even though they came up with some very innovative ideas, a lot of times what holds us back is the company itself. You know, a lot of companies, speaking of fear, have a phenomenal fear and, and really have an issue with doing something really um, radical. Uh, but every project is quite different, you know, I, I think. If tomorrow you're doing a line of, I don't know, vases that were blown in Murano, you know, I'm not really sure what research you need. You need to go and sit there and watch the guys blow glass and really understand that, and then you come up with your ideas, you know, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Not really. Next question. Here, don't be shy. <laughs> Oh man, okay, so um, I've actually had pretty much very well prepared question before I came here, but um, you pretty much um, answered all of them. So the only thing that had I wondered so much while you were talking is that... Whoops. Um, how do you... Oops. Okay. I should have taken those down a long time ago. <laughs> how do you keep this energy and positive hold, attitude? Hold a second. Is it, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now it's symmetrical. Cool. <laughs> are, are, <laughs> well, okay. What's what's what's more beautiful to look at, that or this? Neither, obviously. But <laughs> so what keeps me positive? So, yeah. Is it the food you eat? I mean, does it come from Mars? Just spill the business to rush it. I'm just, because like the environment I live in affects me a lot. And yeah. I started in New York. I'm a fashion designer or an una stilista, as Italians would say. And um, like when I first moved to New York, I was pretty much dressed in all in these vibrant colors and stuff. And then after a while, the city turned me into someone who wears black and white. The city didn't turn you, you turned yourself. Okay. You're in control of yourself. Oh man, okay. I know I, know I shouldn't have, get into the discussion, but you can shape your own destiny. My, I decided to shape my destiny. You know what my destiny is? to make very, very positive, high energy, functional, smart, new things, spaces, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm determined. I'm determined. That's it. You can be mm. determined. You want to walk around dressed all in pink tomorrow? Go ahead and do it. Why not? Okay, but also when it comes to designing process, like you, you don't care about the commercial stuff, obviously. I, I, are you, you kidding? Say... You kidding? I'm steeped in, in commercialism. I'm a whore. <laughs> Let me explain what that means. Someone said to me, oh, how can you do 4,000 products on the market? Because I compromise. I listen, I try to collaborate, and I try to make things happen. And I know a lot of times if I was a little bit more arrogant or more stubborn mm -hmm. or more like that I believe my ideas are the best, which I don't, none of those things would have ever got to market. I know so many designers, I know very famous designers who produce so little because they could not stand industry, and they couldn't stand people telling them what to do. So I'm not, you're not, I'm not completely free, but within that framework, within the criteria, which I kind of love criteria, actually, I have an art show coming up in November in Los Angeles, I have no idea what to do, because I have no criteria.
You know what I always say about art? It's the most selfish act, isn't it? If you're an artist, you go to the studio in the morning, do whatever the hell you like. If you're a designer, you gotta listen to that person, you gotta listen to that, there's this technology, there's that, there's that market, there's that trade show, right? You're loaded with stuff. You're an architect, the amount of stuff to build a building. And your ideas eventually are getting a little pushed, a little pushed, you gotta hang in there. And the reason you gotta be positive and believe is so something materializes, because there's nothing worse than all that energy dissipated and nothing came out of it. Exactly. Companies, some companies run around the world and they go, oh, we want to do concept, some conceptual designs. Nothing's going to be produced, it's just concept. I had Nissan tell me to do concept cars. I turned them down. I don't want, I'd love to make a car tomorrow. I'd, I'd love to make a little electrical cube that can drive like that. But they wanted, they said it's not, a, I said, give me a production car. Because I don't want to waste my time. I don't care. Okay, so we gotta be brave. Okay. I believe. So, and if you want to know about, what did you say about food? Yeah. I have my secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? Okay, so my question is about how well are you adopting the new technologies, let's say HoloLens, HD Survive, or 3D designing in this space as a designer? How what? Sorry? How well are you adopting the new how technologies? How well? Yeah. Are you really spending time in education? I don't, I don't do any of the 3D anymore. I used to do a lot. Mm -hmm. In the 90s when I was on my own, I did tons. But now I just, I don't have time to do that. And there's people who are very good at it, and I have good teams around the world, and they, they can help me and do that stuff, yeah. I think as a young designer, you have no choice. You have to be up to speed and know the stuff, because it's the only point of entry into an office. I don't think there's anybody out there who's going to hire you if you're not up to speed with those skills. But you could argue it was similar back in the day. Back in the day, when I went into an office to get a job, I had to know how to draft, for example. And the difference was I was using a pencil, but today you've got to know AutoCAD. You know? So skills are critical. Once you're in the office and people start to see that you have contribution and ideas and thoughts, then you can evolve there. Just be careful not to stay as a CAD jockey, you know? That's always a tricky one. Are you up to speed with all that stuff? Are you good with software? Oh. Uh, okay, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Kusura bakmayın İngilizce bilmiyorum da. Çevirebilecek mi birisi sorumuzu? Simultane. Ah. Oh. I don't have translation. I could just kind of pretend I know what you're saying. Yeah. Empathy. <gülüyor> Empathy. <gülüyor> Öncelikle... Hold a second. Evet, evet, evet, evet, evet, evet, evet. Volume. Put it on the right. What channel? Try. Evet, beni anlayabiliyor musunuz şu an? <gülüyor> Bence anlayamıyor. Yes. Ha. Ee, öncelikle bize bu şansı verdiğiniz için size teşekkür ederiz. Ben iç mimarlık öğrencisiyim. Ee, ve iki farklı hocadan proje dersi alıyoruz. Bir proje tasarlayabilmek için, bir tasarım yapabilmek için. Ee, şimdi ortada tartışılan bir konu var. Ee, form fonksiyonu mu takip eder? Fonksiyon formu mu takip eder? E, sürekli bu ikisinin arasında kalıyoruz. Siz de bir endüstriyel tasarımcısınız. E, geçen haftalarda da e, sizi işlemiştik biz dersimizde ve şanstan bu hafta karşımıza çıktınız. E, sizce form fonksiyonu mu takip eder? Yoksa fonksiyon mu formu takip eder? Bizi bir aydınlatırsanız pazartesi gün proje dersimiz var ve cevabınızı kullanmak istiyorum. Evet. <gülüyor> You're, you're a funny guy. Teşekkürler. <laughs> you know... Yes, please. You know, if you, if you asked a structural engineer to make a chair, and it has to be, let's say, 45 centimeter from the ground, you know, three or four degrees for comfort, back a little bit, 
certain dimension this way, right? 18 centimeters, whatever. There is not an absolute, meaning every engineer would come up with a different solution. Don't you find that fascinating? What it means, too, is when we do buildings and engineers work on them, every engineer could do a different solution. I love that, because what that means is there's something that they're adding from them, from their sensibility. So there's a creative act. As an engineer, you can be creative engineer. Just like as a doctor, you can be a creative doctor. In other words, we all can be creative within our own field. <coughs> Form follows function was a Bauhaus doctrine. Actually, it was before that. It was Verkbund. To, when they said function then, they were talking about mechanical function. So if I had something like rotating, I would design the end of the object, the plastic round, because the gear is there. So I would use platonic form to kind of encase the mechanisms of what was going on. Today, if you want to expand the definition of function, then you could still say form follows function. But function today is building this better experience, which means psychological, it can be even spiritual, it's ergonomic, it's physio uh, what's the word I'm looking for, anthropometric, the, the function goes broader now. What's the function of if you make, I made a soda bottle years ago for co Coca-Cola, and it was a new flavor of sparkling waters. And I used to love, back in the 80s, Sony released these cassette tapes for children that when they put the tape in and they listened to the music, they would smell strawberries or, you know? So I looked into the technology, it's very cheap technology, you put it into the plastic. So when you break the seal, you would smell lemon before you drink lemon. So I did this for Coca-Cola, right? Is that form follows, fun how does that fit into form follows function? The function here was a sensorial experience. Touch of the bottle, the feel against your lip, the smell, even sound, because we can design sound. If somebody thought more about sound, for example, in hotels, many hallways, you can hear people because they're not designing sound. Or they design a door that slams too hard, the, the sound of the, the mechanism. We can design these things. Is that form follows function? So I, I, many years ago, I used to teach my students form follows subject. What is a subject? The form will come from the subject matter. Tell them that. <laughs> okay, any more? We'll do one more question. Hello. Hello. Uh, what is the relationship between artificial intelligence and creativity? Artificial intelligence and creativity? Yes. I think artificial intelligence can um, be a catalyst. It can engage the brain into being more creative. That's all. Thank you. It's like, you know, years ago, the surrealists, the painting movement of the surrealists, they all decided to take opium one night over a weekend, and they painted all weekend. Do you ever see these paintings they did? Okay. And it, it was atrocious, the work. They felt it was an embarrassment. It's actually not. It's very interesting work. So I think if you can take the mind somewhere where it wouldn't typically be, first of all, you can move the mind from the issues of pre-association, of fear, of all those things, and allow it to be free for a moment and that moment of real freedom, I think, is an opportunity to do something really creative, really original, I think. Just an anecdote. I don't do drugs. <laughs> That's not where that conversation was going. But anyway.
Thank you for your okay. question. Thank you. Thank, so. thank you, everybody. Um, could you please wait on the stage for the plaque? Sure. Okay. Değerli misafirler, Sayın Karim Reşid'e konuşmalarından ve paylaştıkları bilgilerden dolayı teşekkür ediyor. Ve değerli konuşmacımıza plaketini takdim etmek üzere İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi Kentsel Tasarım Müdürü Sayın Ömer Turan'ı sahneye davet ediyorum. <gülüyor> Kindly step this way please. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So much pleasure. Saygıdeğer yeah. konuklarımız, İstanbul Tasarım Zirvesi'nin ilk günü sona ermiştir. Katılımlarınızdan dolayı teşekkür ediyoruz. Programımız yarın saat 10'da. Keynote oturumuyla devam edecektir. Hoşçakalın. <gülüyor>